Uh, David, come on and sit down, sit down. Uh, I guess I forgot to tell you that the show is no longer at 11, it's at 10. Well, that makes my life easier. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. So uh, we started off talking about uh, Kaiser Wilhelm uh, uh, holding uh, holding Queen Victoria, the dying Queen Victoria, in his arms, and a few years later, the three big crowned heads of Europe are all uh, fighting with each other. They're all gone, and they're all cousins. Yeah, it's uh, he was he was very. An Anglophile, actually, to some extent, and after the war, he got more so. Um, the whole, right about now, a hundred years ago, oh, yeah. what's happening right now is the invasion of Belgium, and the Germans are that getting... That happened that quickly? Yeah, it, well, I mean, the, the, you know, the shooting is in, what, late June or something, so they have just crossed the border into Belgium, they've run into resistance. They say, you know, just let us through, and the Belgians say, no, because then that means we're on your side. And it is the fortresses of Liège, which get bogged down, and there's a... The Germans have these big berthas, but they don't have a lot of them. They have to, like, get them, you know, some stuff from Austria. They don't have enough guns to do the job right away. Ludendorff is the guy who sort of knocks on the door at... Uh, Liège and says surrender and they and then the all the fortresses go one by one by one but there's a, a slowing down the Germans the German plan changes originally they were going to attack uh, the Netherlands as well which works out very well for the Kaiser because then he has a place to go into exile yes <laughs> right yes. <laughs> uh, but if they had not shaved away that Schlieffen plan one after another after another with Moltke changing it, weakening it, sending troops in because the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming. You talked about how things fa go fast. The Russians were not supposed to invade East Prussia so fast. And when they do, the Germans, or Moltke, uh, the commander on the Western Front of, of the whole army, panics and starts pulling troops away from when he's supposed to be crushing France. And then you get the Marne and taxi cabs and you know, yeah, right. Yeah. So, uh, okay, everybody's got a battle plan. What were they fighting about? I mean, millions of people died. What, what, at least when it started, they must have had a goal in the war. What, uh, you know, aside from beating each other, what, what, what was the goal? What did they hope to, well, I can what did anybody hope to gain? I can see what the Austrians are up to, because basically you assassinate your your next uh, emperor king, and that, that's virtually an act of war. And it, it, it's interesting to see how that assassination goes down. There are, there are some real similarities to Dallas. Really? Yeah, because um, what happens is after the first, after the morning when a bomb is thrown at the archduke and his wife, the countess Sophie, um, they continue on uh, with a, a couple of things, and then they said, maybe we better scram. But the Archduke, who is not the most wonderful guy in the world, does something very human and nice. He says, I want to go to the hospital and say hello to the guy who was in the back car and got wounded some. The car ahead of him doesn't know the plan has changed. And then his driver says, hey, we're going the wrong way. And he stops just as JFK's car stopped after the first shot, okay, which missed. So the Archduke chauffeur stops five feet away from Gavrilo Princip. Who it's just happened to be just there. Just happened to be there, and everyone else had sort of scattered away. They had trouble because of the great crowds at throwing bombs. That was a problem. They couldn't get the bombs out, so he can't get his bomb out. He <laughs> fires once shoots the Archduke in the jugular vein, sort of like Kennedy being shot yeah, in the back yeah. of the neck. And then the Countess Sophie starts climbing over the car, and she's leaning over her husband. Think of Jackie Kennedy yeah, on yeah. the back of the car, except she gets plugged. She yeah. gets plugged in the stomach, and they're both, they're both dead with, within an hour. Uh, was Princip acting with anybody else? Or was yeah, it was, a, it was a big conspiracy. And, and there were about five of these guys, the first guy who threw the bomb in the morning. Then there were other people who couldn't, you know, they couldn't get the guns out of the bombs okay. out. They just said, ah, oh, this isn't a good idea. 
All right, you say you say this is uh, essentially an act of war, but it wasn't an act of war of the Serbian government. It's uh, not like they, the, 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 the Serbian intelligence uh, operation was wasn't uh, part of this. Uh, the Austrians put out like a ten-point ultimatum. The Serbians um, agreed to nine of those points, and the tenth one is basically we, con- we conduct no, we conduct the investigation. Yeah. You know, we're we're going to find out what really happened here. So, the Austrians have a gripe, even though nobody really likes uh, the Archduke, um, and uh, they're, they're, they're they're everyone is on vacation too. So it takes weeks. It's August. Yeah, it's August There's, or July. The Kaiser goes yeah. off on his yacht to uh, yeah. uh, Norway, and, and it takes people a while to get back. But all the while, all the while, the armies are, like, mobilizing and putting, putting their plans out. It's still crazy. It is crazy. It is uh, crazy. Uh, so Austria. Uh, Austria, well, who declared war on whom, ultimately? The Some, first, somebody mobilized first, uh, I think, the, right? the Austrians are, are pretty much mobilizing against the Serbs. The Russians mobilize against the Austrians. The Germans say, stop mobilizing, uh, giving, you know, backing the Russians into a corner. you got, like, 72 hours to stop. So they're backed into a corner. The Russians don't stop. The Germans declare war on, on Russia. Uh, at that point, the French are bound to buy the treaty to declare war on Russia. Nothing happened uh, with on Germany. On Germany. Uh, Germany. Uh, and and the, the, the British are watching to see what's going on. They are sort of morally tied to France and Russia, but they're not formally obligation to, obligated to go to war until the Germans uh, pass through Belgium. And that's like an old treaty. That's very old. Uh, 1838, probably when, when Belgium is, is established. Uh, by the way, this is WCSS 1490 in Amsterdam, New York. It's about 11 o'clock, and uh, our guest is noted presidential historian David Petrusha, who's written uh, uh, many books uh, on many subjects. Uh, none of which about World War One. <laughs> none about World War One, but you have you have certainly uh, Woodrow Wilson was a key figure in your book 1920, right, the Year right, of the Six right. Presidents. Uh, and you're certainly familiar with the, uh, with the, with that era. Yeah. Uh, you had any uh, relatives in World War One? Yeah, uh, kinda. Um, in none as combatants that I know of. I mean, there must be some, you know, uncle cousin sort of things. But what happens is that um, my great grandmother decides to go back to Europe in 1914 to look at some property thing and she takes my father's uncle Leo with her the baby Leo and they they get trapped by the by the war uh, they're, they're going back to Austrian Poland and the Cossacks come in you know because the Russians uh, pretty much make mincemeat of the Austrian army just about everyone does so so they're coming in uh, they have to hide out while the Cossacks are coming. And uh, Leo actually got, like, smallpox or something. His, his face was a little scarred after, you, you after that. Him. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I, I suppose we should point out that prior to World War I and for a couple hundred years, the, uh, uh, Poland uh, didn't exist. Uh, well, for about a hundred years, really. Yeah, so we're late. Yeah, late. Uh, yeah, late nineteenth century. You know, they're carved. Eighteenth century. Rather. You know, seventeen ninety three or so is like the last partition, and then it's reconstituted as the Grand Duchy of Poland, as a Napoleonic vassal state, and as a. King- but only very briefly. Yeah, yeah, and as a kingdom of Poland at first, as a as a Russian vassal state, and that lasts until eighteen thirty. When the when the Poles revolt and and the, the Russians squash that right about the same time there was like a, a Grand Duchy or a Principality of Krakow as well, and, and that that kind of gets squashed. Now your your people were from the Austrian section from of the Poland. Galician Austrian Austrian section all from all from a very small perimeter was the, handful the, of villages. The villages. final partition was uh, between the Prussians uh, Russians and Austrians basically. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that was that was it. And uh, um, 
Frederick the Great said of the emperors of uh, Frederick the Great of Prussia said basically of uh, the Empress Maria Theresa of Austria of, that she was like you know oh this is so terrible what she what we're doing to Poland and um, Frederick the Great says of her she wept but she kept on taking <laughs> well so somebody's going to take them right yeah you got to go okay Gavin thank you yeah, thank you thank you bye bye Keep uh, listening. Yeah. <laughs> Jim, you can move in. Thank you. Um, wow. So, a anyway, so we got all these alliances that, that trigger the war. Right. But uh, obviously, this isn't the war. Wasn't really about the, the assassination of the archduke, or the not really, or the people arguments don't, between people Austria don't care and Serbia. About it. The reaction to that is very muted. Yeah. And. Most I think you told me the uh, emperor himself didn't attend the funeral. No, he comes back into <laughs> town. He comes back into town from his country home and does not attend the funeral. He just doesn't like him. Does wow. not like him at all. Wow. Nobody seemed to like him. He, had a, he was a prickly personality. He had some interesting ideas which might have kept the um, monarchy together further in terms of splitting apart the... Uh, um, uh, nationalities even more, giving them more autonomy, because you'd have the the Hungarians were doing pretty well after the revolution of 1848 and the creation of the dual monarchy, but the other nationalities were not were not happy campers at all. The South Slavs, in particular, uh, and the and the Czechs. The Czechs were very fractious. Interestingly enough, in the Austrian Parliament, the Reichsrat. Um, you would find the Polish delegates voting generally with the German delegates against the Czechs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I left my heart in old Silesia. Yeah. Wow. Uh, but, you know, we, looking back, we think of World War I as this uh, the battle between the Germans, the French, and the British, uh, and the Russians, none of whom were involved in the initial confrontation whatsoever. Uh, well, no, it, it's it's be, the and they all think it's going to be over quickly, and and it's it's one of those problems of looking to historical data. You know, every president elected in zero is going to die, and blah 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 blah, and this is going to happen, and that's right. going to happen, and precedent does not guarantee a uh, future. Past performance does not necessarily guarantee future, uh, you yeah, know, results. Future, future results. Right. Uh, so you take a look at the wars which precede World War One. There's two Balkan wars which occur occur just before that in Europe. They're quick, and dirty, and over. There's a Turkish uh, uh, Italian war, over and done with. Uh, the Boxer Rebellion, the Spanish American War, the Franco Prussian War, the Seven Weeks War between, or, or the German-Austrian War, just before that, the German-Danish War, the Crimean War is fairly quick. It's a, it's a messy, but it's fairly quick. So they think that's, that's the way it's going to go, but no, it turns into something more akin to the, the Napoleonic Wars, which just, you know, go on forever. And, you know, before that, you had Hundred Years Wars. So this was sort of a medium-sized <laughs> duration for Europe. But the preceding ones were, you know, it's like, yeah, wars aren't long. What's the problem? I'm a bit confused about the state of the Balkans uh, just before World War I. Uh, uh, Austria, the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, was pretty vast. Uh, did it include some of the Balkan states directly? Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, you know, Balkans and Balkans, Dalmatia, they had the coastline almost all the way down to Montenegro. Uh, the the South Slav states had almost no no sea coast, but what and and prior to about 1908, there is still a pretty big Turkish presence in the European mainland. So that um, they they are they are knocked out of like northern Greece and Macedonia about that time. They're they're reduced. Then yeah. to that little piece of Europe Bulgaria? they have now, Bulgaria gets bigger. The second the second Turk Balkan War is against Bulgaria. 
well, the other, the Christian states unite against um, Turkey in the first war, and then in the second war, they unite against Bulgaria, and they, they take some of their territory away. For example, Romania uh, gets something. Um, and, and they end up, you know, on the German side of, of things uh, in, well, the, in, so the, in the Great War. Romania, but, but, Romania was independent? Yeah, there are Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, Montenegro are all in Greece, are all independent at that time. The, and then, again, around 1908, what happens and which, which causes, which really causes the assassination of the Duke four years later, is that as the Turkish Empire disintegrates in Europe, one of the biggest chunk is Bosnia Herzegovina, which the Serbians have their eye on, uh, but the Austrians just come in and take it as if they don't have enough nationalities. You know, <laughs> well, it's as if as if things aren't confusing enough, they they take it, and that's that is where the assassination occurs. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the the Balkans are, you know, that that big powder keg, and that's where you had just had two wars. So it is it is logical to speak of them as the as the powder keg of Europe, and that's 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 what again. And how much how much it. influence uh, did Austria have over these Balkan states at that point? Zippo. Oh. None. None. And, and they're, uh, other they're, than what they, and, and, and Bosnia and, and, yeah, they and so they're they're you know they're pretty much at odds with all of them. And think of. Think of. Uh, well, are, you, are you saying the Archduke wouldn't even have been there in Sarajevo if? Uh, uh, yeah. It, why would it, he? Why would he go there if it was still Turkish? And why would the Serbs or, or be that mad at him? Yeah. 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 It, I don't think it would have been independent. It might have been. I mean, it's it's. Or it might have been it's, Serbian. It's a fairly Muslim area, you know. So it, actually, it's not even a good fit, as we found out during the Clinton administration with right. the Serbs. Right. It was. It's really not a good fit with them. You yeah. know, they think of that whole Kosovo thing and the battles going back hundreds of uh, hundreds of years, yeah, and, and they remember it. Yeah, uh, yeah, Sarajevo being destroyed during that yeah. during the Clinton administration. Basically, I think that I think that the assassination date may have even been the anniversary of the Battle of Kosovo. Yeah. Okay, these things tend to tie in together. Also, this month, a hundred years ago, we have the death of Pius the Tenth. Ah. Pius the tenth on August the third issues a statement to all the Catholic peoples of Europe saying Pray that this stops. Pray that this stops. And then about two weeks he's he's dead and we get we get uh, uh and Benedict Benedict the fifteenth. Right. Uh, yeah. the, the, the war really killed him too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was in Washington last week and visited the uh church old saint mary's it's called saint mary mother of god in chinatown essentially which of course was originally a german church because neighborhoods change a lot they do and uh and at that church i think because it was the german church or maybe because it's a fairly traditional parish uh there is the uh the shrine to the blessed Karl, emperor last emperor of austria who really did try to work out a negotiated and just peace in 1916 without uh, from 1916 on uh, he was the only one to really accept Benedict's peace plan and try to stop the killing didn't do him much good he was he was overthrown in in 1918 he's, he's about the only monarch who really tries to get back uh, the others just sort of go and hide uh, he tries to get back. He lands a plane on the roof of the parliament in Budapest, and they kind of escort him out of the country into exile. And where you know a lot of these monarchs have cash squirreled away, somehow he didn't. So he and his very large family, which was about ten kids, uh, have to go off. And one of them is is the um, uh, Archduke uh, Otto. Otto von Habsburg. Otto von Habsburg, who eventually becomes the president of Europe. But the, the road to that, very conservative guy, uh, the road to that is, is not a happy road. Uh, they go off to live in the Azores. They are given a um, uh, place to live there, which is so unpleasant and unheated. And I don't even know how cold the Azores gets. We're not 
we're not talking about the Scottish Islands, okay? Right. Uh, but it is so bad that, that he comes up with, uh, you know, influenza or something like that and just dies in his, in his 40s. And the Empress Zeta, who, who died not that long ago as these things go, uh, took her, her children to Montreal to exile. They were so poor, uh, she went into the parks to harvest dandelions for them to eat. The Holy Roman Empress. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, not the Holy Roman Empress, but but close, close enough, enough. Yeah. Uh, wow. Uh, little uh, little family tree here. At the beginning of the beginning of the war, uh, Austria was ruled by Franz Joseph. Franz Joseph, the second of Austria. Uh, he had been on the throne since I think 1848 or so. Wow. He was a very long reigning monarch as was Queen Victoria, and if Kaiser Wilhelm had not been overthrown, he would have reigned from 1888 to 1941. Wow. He would have had a, 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 a spectacularly long reign. Um, and, and maybe, uh, well, no, I mean, you know, maybe um, Who knows Carl wouldn't have died and he uh, frozen to death if he was still a king, you know? Yeah, right, right. Because right. he, he, he was a very, now, very young. Now, uh, the Archduke heir to the throne was what to Franz Joseph? A nephew? He was like a nephew or something. And, the, and, the and where does Carl come Well, the Car family tree, he's even a further relative, obviously. But the family tree of the Habsburgs is, is uh, you know, you talk about the Kennedy curse. The Habsburgs are worse uh, Franz Joseph's wife, the Empress Elizabeth, who was known as the most beautiful woman in Europe, was assassinated when she was visiting the Greek islands. Wow. His brother was the Emperor Maximilian of Mexico. Of, oh, wow. Yeah. And was sure. put up against a, a wall and shot. Right. His son was Cinco crown, de Mayo. <laughs> yeah, his son was the uh, crown prince Rudolf of Meyerling, who was a suicide. He was having an affair, or well, I don't know if you'd call it affair, but he was in love with this uh, commoner, and they, they uh, I think, both killed themselves. He certainly did. So you've got those three dead um, in 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 line for the throne and then you have Franz Ferdinand and his wife Franz Ferdinand again is is it's one of those morganantic marriages where the Countess Sophie uh, you know that's why she's the Countess Sophie and not like the Archduchess Sophie um, that uh, um, th if they had issue and I don't think they did I don't think they had ch I've never heard of them having children uh, that they would not have been in line for the throw, and then it would have reverted to uh, Carl anyway. So they were getting pretty far afield as to who the next uh, next emperor and king would be, because it is the dual monarchy, and uh, you know there's no emperor of Austria, uh, Hungary. There's an emperor of Austria. There's a there's a king of Hungary, and and then there are all the titles. You know, uh, Grand Duke of uh, of, uh, of of Krakow, King of Bohemia and Moravia. There's about twelve of these things because they, you know, it, they just kept accumulating right. real estate through the years. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Wow. But, uh, just it, it, just as just as uh, Wilhelm II was Emperor of Germany and King of Prussia. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because they're 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 a federal state. Uh, after the Franco-Prussian War, and you have all those, the South German states and, and free cities in the north and grand duchies, etc., you know, principalities, uh, all, all kind of muscled in. And they're largely Catholic, so it's not, it's not entirely a good mix. Wow. I mean, they are. Prussia is, is very uh, Lutheran. The North German states are Lutheran. And the, uh, I, I read something just recently where it said that when Wilhelm and the other Protestant monarchs had to give up their th uh, 
Thrones in 1918, and particularly Wilhelm, uh, that when they left, it was like cutting off the head of the Protestant churches in Germany and was very disorienting to them because he was the he was like not only the king but like the head bishop or something and so you see that the protestant peoples of germany are even more disoriented than the catholics in the post war and the protestant nazi vote is big the catholic is much 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 less and where where was adolf hitler uh, during the war he's on the western front um he had moved to from Vienna to Munich about 1912. There is a famous photograph of him in the crowd at the Odeon Platz in Munich, uh, taken by, this is a wild coincidence, taken by his later official photographer, Heinrich Hoffmann. And they said, you know, it's like, so you were there that day, huh? Oh, I was there. And they look for, they look at this picture and it's like, there he is. And he's He's a happy guy that there's, there's war. He goes to the Western Front. He's a courier. He's a regimental courier messenger. He's not a combatant. He faces fire. He, he's, he's the guy that just everybody shoots at. He's the guy who everyone shoots at. But, you know, before he takes office in 1932, uh, a, a socialist comrade, a uh, political opponent, says, uh, you know, there's there's regimental couriers and there's there's frontline couriers, and he was a regimental courier. And there's not one guy, one father of four, or married guy who wouldn't have loved to have switched with him because he had a nice, clean right. billet. And the rest of us were were out there, but nonetheless, he wins the Iron Cross second class. Not that big a deal for an enlisted man, but then the Iron Cross first class, which is a huge deal. And how he gets it is is quite the mystery, quite the mystery, although he, he gives an account of it to an American correspondent in 32, where he basically bluffs a bunch of French troops. Uh, you know, it's like, okay, man, hold your fire, and he's, he's alone. And he gets these guy. He gets the French troops to surrender, and that seems as good an account as, that, that's as pretty any. Mu- that's pretty much how my wife's great grandfather got the Medal of Honor in the Civil War. Basically, the same story. Yeah. Although he was nothing like Adolf Hitler. Right? Well, I'm have. glad to hear that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and and then he is um, he he gets like a shrapnel or slight wound in the war, and at the end of the war, he is hit by poison gas. And, and blinded, but the blindness seems to be not a physical blindness. It is, it is a hysterical, psychosomatic blindness. So he is sent. It's, it's pretty, it's, it's not played up a lot, but it is pretty well established that he is in the psych ward. He is in the psych ward of the hospital <laughs> and not the physical blind war. Who, who would have thought? Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Where's Benito Mussolini during World War One? He starts the war as a socialist journalist and then um, becomes very pro-war uh, and very pro-nationalist. I think he serves, he serves in the war as well, uh, up, in the, uh, you know, up against the Austrians. Uh, Italy is involved in the war? Yeah, Austria double-crosses the Germans and the Austrians. Uh, they are part of the Triple Alliance. They're supposed to come in the war. Uh, for Germany and Austria. Italy? Yeah, yeah. It, Italy is supposed to come in on the side of Germany. Right, and in 1915, though, they get a better offer. You know, like in the in duck soup, it's like, yeah. you know, it's like Ciccolini. I've, right. I've changed sides, boss. Yeah, right. <laughs> or right. what? Uh, I got a better offer. They get a better offer. They, they you know, they're going to get, you know, uh, something from Greece. They're going to get Asia Minor from the Turks, whatever. <laughs> and, 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 and they are double-crossed. Well, the double-crossers often get double-crossed, so they're double-crossed at the peace treaties. And that's, again, another thing which helps start World War II because they're, they're, they feel cheated by the peace. The Germans feel cheated by the peace. Wow. Uh, so... Ultimately, the United States gets involved after uh, a 1916 election in which uh, the president of the United States, Woodrow Wilson's 
uh, principal theme is he kept us out of war. Right. And what, about a month after his second inauguration, uh, we're at war. Yeah. How did, how did that come about? Two things, largely. The, the Germans and, and Ludendorff, who's a real nut, uh, General Ludendorff, he's, he's almost like the de facto dictator of Germany at this point has decided to, to go for the big knockout blow. And, and freedom of the seas. Remember, you know, how one of the 14 points is freedom of the seas? Well, the Germans have no freedom of the seas during the war. They're, they are blockaded. They're starving to death. And they decide, well, two can play this game, and we're going to play it with, with submarines, and we're going to play it really rough. They had sunk the Lusitania before the election, a British liner cost some American lives, and they decide to resume unrestricted submarine warfare. This ticks the Americans off. No end. But uh, there's also a second thing which is going on, is that the British government, British intelligence, has intercepted these so-called Zimmerman telegraph. Zimmerman is the foreign minister of Germany. He sent a telegraph to the government of Mexico, which we have not had good relationships with for the, during the entire Wilson administration. Blackjack Pershing had to put the American Expeditionary Force into Mexico, um, and we were going around chasing Pancho Villa. Via, we had Pancho Villa, um, and uh, and uh, sending troops into uh, Veracruz, uh, or even before that. So there's trouble with Mexico even before this, and Zimmerman sends a telegram saying, why don't you come into the war on our side and you can have back all the territory you lost in that Mexican-American war. You can have Texas and you know New Mexico take it all. California. Yeah, and so this is, uh, this and, is and, and, interpreted and, and, as a hostile act. This is a significantly hostile act, it would seem to me. Yeah, yeah. And, and recall yeah. the Hearst Press. We talk about the Hearst Press in the Spanish-American War, uh, bringing, bringing us into that war. Um, Hearst is an isolationist, but he really doesn't like the Japanese, and he doesn't like the Mexicans. I think there's a, there's a war, there's a, uh, he makes a serial, um, because he was making motion pictures, which was called Pro Patria at this time. And it was so anti-Japanese. It was like, you know, the, the yellow peril kind of thing, and anti-Mexican, that the uh, Wilson administration uh, basically censored it and, and, and said, stop it, you know, because at that point we were, we were the allies of the Japanese against the Germans in that war. Uh, the, really? Yeah, yeah, because the Japanese were bound by treaty to the British, and, and they wanted to grab the German concession in the Shantung Peninsula in China. Uh, they also want to grab the Pacific Islands. Oh, yeah, that's how they picked up Saipan and the Marianas. And they, yeah. they pick up yeah. the islands in the Western Pacific, yeah. and they probably had their eye in uh, the, the Germans had uh, half of uh, New Guinea. They really? had like a quarter of New Guinea. The Australians ended up with it. Okay, uh, they they probably were looking at that. They wanted they wanted all those things. Even after the war, the Germans and the or the Japanese and the British were bound together by treaty. So until Hughes negotiates, Secretary of State Charles Evans Hughes negotiates with the Japanese and the Five Power Naval Agreement and some ancillary agreements. Uh, it was conceivable that if there had been a war uh, between the United States and Japan, that Britain would be uh, compelled by treaty to attack us. The Japanese basically uh, uh, kept an eye out for the British interests in the Far East uh, during that time frame then, during the first Well, World yeah, with the, with the Germans, because the, the, what the uh, uh, British are afraid of is not so much German industrial power or land power, but they are terrified of the arms race which the which the Kaiser has put forward to build like something 20 dreadnought battleships which are, you know, which were the, you know, the uh, iPhone of uh, armaments at that time. Right. 
Uh, this is WCSS 1490 on your dial in Amsterdam, New York. This is a continuation of the show with no name with noted presidential historian. It's the show with no end. <laughs> with, yes, with David, uh, David Petrusha, who, will be, uh, who is discussing, uh, well, basically we started off with the anniversary, 100th anniversary of the beginning of World War I, which was like yesterday. I yeah. Guess. yeah. The first shots uh, fired in World War I. Uh, I understand we're actually uh, in uh, Australia. Uh, uh, four hours after the declaration of war, uh, uh, German merchant ships tried to get away from the Austria, uh, Australian coast and uh, were fired on by Australian uh, guns. Hmm, that's odd. I guess it's, they're, yeah. they're not really at well, war they, right away. Uh, well, but uh, the war had been declared and they, uh, they were doing their part. Well, probably between the uh, Commonwealth and, and the, and the yeah. uh, Germans. Uh, the Germans have to sweep past the, the Belgians uh, to, to get at the British. The British have landed and uh, in the northern sector of the Western Front. The British or the Germans actually meet British forces significantly before they meet French forces. How did the, the British get there so fast? Uh, I don't think they had a lot of guys, but they're you know they're not that far away, and they're 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 working at it. The French have what they call Plan Seventeen. Ah, the Germans have the, from outer space. That's right. The Germans have the Schlieffen Plan, and the French have the Plan Seventeen, which is to attack through Alsace because Alsace and Lorraine had been taken from France in the Franco-Prussian War of the 1870s, and they are just obsessed with Alsace and Lorraine. The Germans purchased that territory at too high a price because it just, the French could never live without it. It was like just the most wonderful area, they, the sacred soil, uh, blah, blah, blah. So they decide they're going to attack through there, and their plan is basically Elan, spirit, uh, attack, attack, attack forward uh which isn't a plan at all and they it's a they, slogan it's a slogan it's <laughs> stupid uh and they they move somewhat forward they advance somewhat the germans aren't too concerned about this and actually they stop them fairly quick uh, uh in that southern sector that's that's not where the action is during the war there's not there's not much going on it's that northern western front where all the killing and all the spectacularness of you know, awfulness goes on so they the germans then sweep past the english moltke has continued to weaken that sweeping move which is supposed to envelop the french armies from behind slows it down the french have time to react and that is the battle of the marne and that is, I guess, General Joffre, brings in the reinforcements from the capital, Paris, to the front by every means possible, including the taxi cabs of Paris. So the army arrives by taxi, by, by taxi. cab. Was the meter running? That's the uh, question. That's it, probably, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the Germans are, are bogged down, and, and they make progress occasionally. Um, the you'll you'll see some movement, and it is all futile movement for the next four years, where you might gain 12 miles at a cost of 200,000 dead, and yeah. then you'd give it back up. Just sheer craziness, and that doesn't that doesn't end until the Americans come in. The um, Americans come in at a time when the Allies are about ready to collapse. Russia has collapsed and has uh, evacuated the Allied side. The French army has mutinied. Uh, in when's, it, when's the big offensive? Spring of 1918. Yeah, the Americans. The Americans don't go into combat for a full year. Yeah. Pershing holds them out of combat essentially, which is driving the Allies nuts. But he doesn't. Well, it took a long time just to get troops over there. They have to get their troops over there. We we fight with no American-made tanks or planes. You know, arsenal of democracy. Uh, not in terms of tanks and planes. Not in terms of, of those things in, in World War One. Well, we have a lot of ships. We have a lot of convoys. Up until the um, the convoy system is a, a, a very important thing. 
because when the Germans reinstitute unrestricted submarine warfare, and we are in the war, you know, when we first go into the war, 25% of all ships trying to make it into Britain are sunk. 25 percent wow the convoy system essentially stops that so that's that's the first turnaround from our entering the war and then we go in and chateau terry and Bielo bello woods and, and places like that the argonne forest, argonne forest. which we Sunday which they're Hill. very heavy heavy casualties for the very short time we're in the war but we have enough oomph to uh, kick over the Germans because the Germans are just completely exhausted, completely exhausted. Now, obviously, sometime after the war begins in August of 1914, there's got to be some peace movements made, right? I mean, everybody had their goals, whatever they were. Uh, Not right away. There's the, there are, on the front lines, you get, there's that the Christmas truce story. Yeah. You know, and then they don't do that. We shoot anyone who tries to do it. Uh, although, th- although there would be, you know, sort of gentlemen's agreements, like you know, just don't let's let's not let's not go crazy here, gentlemen. Yeah. Um, and then you get it, the peace movements with with Benedict the Fifteenth in in the war, and and the Emperor Carl trying to do something. But basically, everyone's figuring we've gone this far. Let's you know, let's go for victory, and um, you know, the Germans, the Germans come very close. I mean, on paper, they're very close, and you could kind of see where they would get this stab in the back theory from. Because on paper, you know, it's like we've beat Russia, we're still controlling northern France. You know, right. how, how do we? Why, why do we surrender? You right. surrendered because if you didn't surrender, you were going to be overrun. You'd be back at the Rhine within, you know. Moments. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, we kind of forget that it, it, if not exactly a global war, it was. Uh, no, it is a global uh, war. Uh, certainly the, the, the whole front included the Turkish Empire. Uh, Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah. All that, all that stuff's going on on the. Bulgaria uh, and Turkey on the are. left flank of the. Are um, uh, allies. And when they, they start to collapse first. And then Austria collapses, and that's that's why Germany is, you know, it's like... How does Turkey get into this in the first place? There had been a lot of German influence uh, with, the, with the Turks, the Berlin to Baghdad Railway. Um, you know, the Kaiser goes down there with a fez on his, his hat and all that. <laughs> and, uh, um, and it's the, Ger- it's the British Empire, you know, which, which looks dangerous to the Turks, and it, and it is, you know. They're, they're the ones who are expanding, um, and, British, and, and a lot of a lot of British had Egypt at that point. They have Egypt and, and, the and Suez Canal. Suez Canal, and that's the key there is to get to India and back, because mm-hmm. India is the jewel of the empire. What um, what really binds the Germans and the Turks together is a lot of German gold. They kind of buy the uh, the Turkish alliance. But in terms of a global war, what we had referenced before, the Shangtung Peninsula with the Japanese taking over the uh, German concession there and the islands. But there is a fantastic, fantastic amount of fighting going on in Africa. The Germans have four large colonies there. They have Togoland and Cameroon in West Africa. They have German Southwest Africa, uh, um, which ha- very mineral rich. Hermann Goering's father had been governor general there. Wow, there was some that's adjacent to uh, South Africa. It's adjacent to South Africa. It became a South African protectorate. Uh, under the League of Nations after the war. It's between uh, there and uh, uh, South Africa and Angola, southern Rhodesia in that area. Uh, at one point, the Germans invade South Africa from there. That, that doesn't quite work. The, the fighting which goes on for... Uh, now, South Africa was what at that point? Was South that Africa's still, still part... British? Yeah, and, and that's one of the things which, which helps lead to the war... 
is that the British had uh, had a colony there in the uh, uh, Free St- not the co- uh, Cape Colony. They had had Cape Colony there for quite a while, but the Dutch Boer people had independent republics there: the Orange Free State and the Transvaal. So these these Afrikaners had been independent until about 1906 or so. Remember that Winston Churchill goes down there to fight? Sure. I think he's, a, he's, he's held captive. He's captured yeah. at one point, and I think he escapes. The plot of young Churchill. So the, the Kaiser mouths off, and he's for the Boers in this war. The, 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 I think Franklin Roosevelt was, too. Hitler was. The, the Boers had a lot well, of... Oh, he's Dutch. Yeah, yeah they had a sense. lot of sympathy. Uh, you know the underdog sort of thing, uh, so that they are uh, the union. That's why they call it the Union of South Africa. Now it's the Republic of South Africa, but before they left the Commonwealth, they were the Union of South Africa because there were these three or four different states which had consolidated. But the real fighting uh, in the African continent is German East Africa, which was. was Tanganyika, okay, yeah. Tanzania, we call it now, and Zanzibar. They had that and also something, oh, they had uh, Rwanda, Burundi. That was theirs. After the war, the Belgians get that. Uh, Tanzania, Tanganyika, the British get that, and they get Zanzibar. But that is where the Germans put up a tremendous fight, and there is this commander down there who fights all the way to the end they can't catch him think of like you know the swamp fox (laughs) so he is out there and they are chasing him for four years they're after him he goes into the portuguese areas he goes into the british areas they can't catch him at one point the germans decide we've got a this guy we like this guy. He's got spunk. <laughs> We've got to help him out. How can we help him out? So they, like, send dirigibles out from Germany to try to resupply him. I think they get as far as Egypt, and that's, that's, that's it. Wow. But, but uh, and then, then he comes back after the war. He's, he's a big hero and such. But, but a, remarkable, uh, a remarkable story of that, that sort of uh, almost lost battalion of, uh, of um, not giving up, you know, like some grand... Uh, uh, like the Japanese out there on an island after World War II. Incredible. So it really was a World War. Yeah, and then of when course, and then of course, all the all the all the uh, battles on the high seas with the submarines. They have a big battle at Jutland right. between the uh, German and British battleships, which on paper is you know if you if you start counting them up, it's pretty much a draw, but the Germans go into their ports. And never, never come out again. Yeah, we were talking before you got here about the, uh, the about the dreadnoughts and the Kiel Canal, and uh, and ultimately, when the Germans thought they had this great advantage because they had they did have the better battleships at the beginning of the war. Probably newer ones. Uh, yeah, uh, but they got nowhere with them, really. Ultimately. No, it's just they, not they, a they great. Didn't, they didn't prove to be a factor. Not a great seafaring power. Uh, wow. How many people killed? How many millions? Uh, ten million. Do, do ten million know? combatants. I think it's ten million combatants. Incredible. Yeah. Uh, whole generation. And, and who knows how many, you know, wounded and such. Uh, and uh, and then you oh and and then you get into the massacre, the massacre of the Christians in the Middle East by the Muslims, the right. Turks and the Armenians. That's going on as well around 1915. <clears throat> So there, there's there's all sorts of of, uh, of uh, things going on well, around the, the, the world. Yeah, the roots of a lot of what today is going on are well. Are yeah, and then and then the the Ottoman Empire is carved up in the Middle East. You get people, or you get the British have Iraq, Jordan, Palestine. The French get Lebanon and Syria. Not as new colonies, but as League of Nations mandates, which is basically the same thing. And the whole Zionist thing, which uh, Zionism precedes World War I, but the Balfour 
declaration and the fact that the British then have control over the area, which puts a whole new spin on things, and the consolidation or the growth of the Arabian monarchy and this thing called oil, which up until you know, ni- you know, before 1914, it's like it's just sand, you know. Yeah. So um, you know, it's it's the things all come together and and not in a in a good way. Well, Turks controlled all of what we now call the Middle East before the war, right? More or less. Well, the interior of Arabia is independent for what it's worth. Who they, are these people called yeah, the Arabs? They have they have Who the sea, they have the sea coast. They have what the Gulf states would be and all the way down into Yemen. Um, the at one point not far long past beyond that they had had Egypt and they had had Libya uh, what was it Tripolitania okay the whole Benghazi thing the Turks or the Italians took that from them in 1911 right so fairly recent yeah and there was uh, Mussolini had to fight a big war big bloody nasty war against the Libyans in the 1930s because they, they were still putting up a fight. And um, I don't know if he used poison gas, but he used poison gas against the Ethiopians. Wow. Something's, something's rattling behind me. I don't know what it is. Uh, anyway, uh, well, if the whole place goes, it goes. Uh, all right. So could Wilson have uh, avoided uh, American involvement? Yeah, he could have turned a blind eye to those last couple of things but I don't think so uh, Theodore Roosevelt would have you know jumped around until well until he was we al- had, he was already jumping around he was already jumping around before then yeah so well, there it, was definitely a, a war it, party out there if you look at movies and 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 also if you're into like Wall Street conspiracy stuff the house of Morgan being the banker for the British and stuff like that yeah uh, not inconsequential, probably. Probably not. Uh, but anyway, the the whole sinking of the Lusitania thing is uh, is widely thought today as being uh, what caused us to get into World War One. But that was it was like a f- two years. Two years before we got into World War One, right? Wasn't that in like the spring of it's 1915? 19, it's 1915, yeah. and the uh, the Germans had placed an ad in the paper saying. Don't get on that boat. Don't get on that boat. And it, it seems that, you know, it was carrying contraband. There was, like, secondary explosions and and all that. So, but people did not like having American nationals killed in, no, in any uh, regard. Uh, of course they didn't. But, again, that's the spring of 1915. A year later, a year and a half later, Wilson is running for re-election. He kept us out of war. Right, you know, right, because we might have gone to war at that time, but we didn't. Right. Now there was a point, was there not, when the now, re- uh, now remember that that there is a faction at that point which thinks when Wilson is still keeping us out of war that he's still too pro-allied, and that would be represented by the fellow who signed my great grandmother's passport, William Jennings Bryan. I still have this in my office. William Jennings Bryan. William Jennings Bryan was Secretary of State, and he resigns as Secretary. I mean, with no particular qualifications to be Secretary of State, except he had been a prominent Democrat for the previous 20 years. And um, Run he's times very the pacifistic, does not like even what Wilson is doing up to the point of 1915, 1916, and he resigns on principle. Uh, because he he wants an even even more pacifistic foreign policy. Wilson replaces him with a guy named Robert Lansing, and Wilson is you know essentially his own Secretary of State at that point, sort of like Nixon and whoever. Right. The uh, Lansing takes us quite a ways into the future because Lansing is related to a guy. He's the uncle of what uh, John Foster Dulles. Is that right? And, of course, Alan Dulles. Wow. Yeah. 
And great uncle of uh, Avery Cardinal Dulles was buried at Orangeville. That's Park. right, at Orangeville. So there's your local connection. We, so we finally did something <laughs> local on this show. I just, just wanted to clarify well, we, we, that. We did you have your... Well, I had my, my relatives in. I had yes. your relatives Uncle Leo, in God bless him. Now, the unrestricted submarine warfare uh, was on and off, didn't, wasn't it? Well, that's right. It's after the Lusitania that Germans pull back, and that's, that's why Wilson is able to pull that off in 1916 and keeping us out of the war. But it is in 1917 when the Germans think they've, they've got to, you know, they've got to deliver the coup de grace and, and they can do this again, like in 1914. We can get this over quickly. And then it'll be over, and but they, you know, they're just wrong, just wrong, and that's that's Ludendorff again. My uh, grandmother was a uh, about uh, eleven years old in 1916 when they came over from Italy, the whole family, and it, uh, it took them 30 days to get from Genoa to the United States, uh, which would ordinarily be a five or six day trip. Yeah, uh, because they were uh, uh, zigzagging all over the South Atlantic, uh, avoiding the German U-boats mm-hmm. a- at that time. Uh, so, you know, one one thing goes wrong there, I'm not here. That's right. That's yeah. right. And and we and and we haven't even talked about the rest of your ancestors. Uh, well, the Irish. The That's Irish. right. The damned Irish. They're like pro-German. Yeah. And well, uh, they're anti-British. They're anti-British. And so in 1916, April, there is um, a uh, revolt of the Irish in Dublin. The post office, the Easter Rebellion, some Easter Monday Rebellion. Uh, Roger Casement, Sir Roger Casement, Michael Collins, all those, all those people involved in an anti-British uprising, which was facilitated by a guy who had been involved in... And here's another reason we come into the war. We'll zip back to Veracruz. At Veracruz, there's a German military attaché. He meets... The American military attaché, or some a fellow who's with the American military there. His name, the American, is named Douglas MacArthur, but the German is named Franz von Papen. No kidding. <laughs> and he gets transferred to the United States as their military attaché. But when war comes, he becomes not so much their spy master, but their saboteur master. And they, because they don't control the seas, and since the House of Morgan and everyone else is is financing um, the supplying of the British Empire and the French and the Russians, it's like, well, why don't we stop, why don't we cut this off at the source? So they start blowing stuff up around here. One of the things they want, he wants to do is, for example, blow up, and he never gets it done, the Welland Canal, you know, by Niagara Falls, which, sure. can, you know, sort of like the mini St. Lawrence Seaway. The thing he does succeed in is the Black Tom explosion. Black Tom was a, uh, an island, and, and there was a huge munition ship which was um, anchored there. It is Jersey City, right by the Statue of Liberty, and it blows sky high it it they have to close the statue of liberty um it is again it is it is they feel the explosion in philadelphia wow it's that big so there are there are all those sabotage things which are also creating immense ill will we can't prove it generally Although oh, finally, this is before we get in. This is before we get in. Oh, wow. You know, that's why that's yeah. why he's the, the attaché here. Right, 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 right. Uh, there's a blunder where one of his agents leaves his briefcase on the subway. And he's being trailed and it's like, "Okay." So he he leaves. He's he's kicked out of America. He helps plot this Easter rebellion in Ireland. He also fights on the Turkish front, okay, where again uh, he almost gets his papers uh, seized, uh, captured by the British uh, as, as they're evacuating Jerusalem. 
And he, he is uh, Chancellor of Germany in 1938. And after he is kicked out by the guy who put him in, a guy named uh, Schleicher, uh, uh, he maneuvers to install Adolf Hitler as Chancellor of Germany and himself as Vice Chancellor. That doesn't work out too well for anyone. In fact, he's kicked out as Vice Chancellor. Within a year, um, he's given some really tough anti-Nazi speeches, one at Marburg, which blasts the whole thing. His career is remarkable because even though it is a series of disasters, one from another, he survives at every step. He should have been killed by Hitler in 1934. He's not. His aides, the guy who wrote the speech, is killed. He's, he's <laughs> arrested. Um, Hitler makes him ambassador to Austria. Then he makes him ambassador to Turkey, where he meets uh, the um, 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 uh, envoy of the Vatican, a fellow named Roncalli, Angelo Roncalli. Pope uh, John the Twenty Third. Yeah. Uh, von Papen had some sort of papal knighthood kind of thing, which had to be renewed somehow. Pius XII was just removed it. Angelo Roncalli put it back for the guy who installed Hitler. When he became Pope, you mean? Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I think I think Poppin lived until like 69. Is that right? Yeah. He wow. Lived, uh, he not only wasn't killed by Hitler and was given these posts, you know, out of the country, which being out of the country kept him from being like hung at Nuremberg. Right. And not only or, was it or, or shot by Hitler after the oh, Valkyrie, right? Yeah, because well, they they uh, a fellow named Schacht, uh, who has been head of the Reich, Reichsbank, is jailed in '44. A very a character like uh, von Papen, um, but um, he is acquitted at Nuremberg. Later on, they throw him in the clink for something because they like, wait a minute, he's no. <laughs> Incredible. Incredible. What are you working on? Well, I'm working on a book on the 1932 election, oddly enough. And that is going to be flipping back and forth chapter to chapter between the United States and Germany, the United States and Germany, the United States and Germany, like writing two books at once. So there, there were two elections that took place in 1932. There are a lot, well, there are many, 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 many elections, uh, particularly in Germany. Hitler doesn't take power in 1932. But then again, neither does Roosevelt. Right. He, you know. Uh, Hitler takes power first in January of 33. Roosevelt doesn't take office until March of 33. Roosevelt wins the election in November of 32, wins you know, a whole bunch of primaries, convention. Hitler faces two presidential elections earlier in the year against Paul von Hindenburg, the incumbent. There's you know, one round and then the incumbent uh, uh, face off, the you know, getting the majority. Two Reichstag elections. And then, unlike in this country, because Germany had been a patchwork uh, of states, even more so than America, uh, there's local elections going off constantly, constantly in Germany. So there, it's like nonstop. It's like nonstop. The German or the Nazis, every so, you know, with every new election, are on the verge of exhaustion, just physically exhausted, financially exhausted. Uh, at any given point, they they could collapse, and they don't. Where did they get their money? Dues. <laughs> Dues. And um, and you know, you go to these, or well, you or you see them, you know, these these big light shows and concerts and Lady Gaga and whatever. And, and Hitler's the Lady Gaga of, of German politics. He's the rock star. So that a lot of the money comes in from the admission. Yeah. One, an American reporter says he's running for office, but the events are structured where he is not asking for your support. For one thing, you pay to get into a campaign rally, okay? Wow. And you wait for him to arrive. 
you wait for him to clear his throat and get going. And the rally is not that he gets your support, but that he supports you. The dynamics are completely reversed. And there's a lot of money which comes in from that. Occasionally there's money with um, interviews from the American press. <laughs> he gives a, a famous interview to Dorothy Thompson, not Dorothy Parker, Dorothy Par- Thompson, uh, Sinclair Lewis's wife, where she meets him at the Kaiserhof Hotel and is um, says, oh, little man, I thought I was going to be meeting the next chancellor, leader of Germany. Oh, little man, you'll never make it. You're nothing. Um, <laughs> she may have been drunk. <laughs> well, uh, we gotta got to kind of wrap it up. Uh, when's the book coming out? Spring. What, what's the full title? I don't know the full title. The full title is 1932. What the subtitle will be is yet to be determined. It's in negotiations. Okay. So each, uh, this coming spring? This coming spring. I'm handing it in. Labor Day. This will so. be uh, what your fourth presidential election book. Yeah, yeah. And your previous ones are in 1920, the year of the six presidents. Uh, 1960. What's the subtitle? Uh, that? LBJ, JFK, and Nixon: The Epic Campaign That Forged Three Presidencies. And then you did 1948. 1948. Uh, you know Harry Truman and whatever. I don't know what it said. <laughs> <laughs> It's Harry Truman. That's all you need to know. Plus, you've done a uh, a number of noted uh, biographies, including uh, Arnold Rothstein and... uh and Kennesaw Mountain Landis. Yes, that, that uh, won the Casey Award for Best Baseball Book of the Year. All right. And numerous numerous other books on... Uh, Calvin Coolidge. On baseball and uh, col- and uh, and politics. Cal- three or four on Calvin Coolidge, right? Three, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, then. And former alderman of the Fourth Ward of the city of Amsterdam. Perhaps my greatest honor. All Oddly right. enough, yes. <laughs> Being the former alderman. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's even better, actually. <laughs> <laughs> which nobody can deny. <laughs> this has been the show with no name. Uh, I'm Bob Going with uh, Jim Nicosia and special guest, noted presidential historian David Petrusha. We'll be back on Friday at the usual time, 10 o'clock, with more of the show with no name. <laughs>